Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And it's uh, webinar, webinar Wednesday. Um, it's, it's, I'm very pleased to have uh, Jared Peacock talk to us today about uh, his proposal for um, a time series standard. Uh, but before we talk about Jared, I'll just remind you, that for those of you who are uh, here the first time, perhaps, um, you can go onto this uh, MTNet MNR page. And there you'll see uh, links to previous MNRs and also the presentations. And you can register for uh, upcoming uh, MNRs. So you're on a, a webinar, which means you can change your audio settings. You can uh, send a chat to us about something. You can, uh, a Q&A, please uh, send your questions in Q&A and um, I'll, I'll read them out probably at the end. And then if you want to talk and we encourage this, please raise your hand um, and then you, you can speak. So before we get on to Jared, just a quick advertisement for uh, next week's uh, MNR that's uh, at the same time, actually. No, an hour later. Uh, Sarah DeVries um, on my global snapshot of EM and inversion, my career so far. So this is an interesting one because it's going to be a, a young female talking about how her career has developed in EM and also some of the work she's been doing. So it would be really exciting. But today we have Jared um, talking about MTH5, a standard data container for MT data time series. Now, Jared uh, did his bachelor's and master's at Colorado State uh, School of Mines, PhD in Adelaide uh, with that wonderful group down there and uh, moved to USGS on a postdoc and then got hired in uh, 2017. A um, couple of publications that uh, Jared is highlighting here, one that's in review on this uh, format, uh, a presentation on uh, meta standards from the USGS, and then a uh, publication on uh, Nevada. So without more ado, Jared, please uh, uh, take over. Sure. What are we sharing here? Right. Hopefully you can see that if you can't. Yep, it's perfect. Okay, cool. Right, all right. Thanks, Alan. Um, thanks for the MNR invitation. Uh, I realize data standards and metadata aren't the most interesting topic, but they're important. And uh, hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll at least come away with some idea of what we're proposing and the tools available and resources if you want to learn more. You know, uh, so there's two things, two silver linings from this pandemic. One was that we couldn't go anywhere, so I had a bunch of time to code. And the second is that we've been forced to communicate in, in various ways and make our community more public. And one of those, one of those things was that you, these MNRs, um, they've drawn a lot of interest from outside people. And uh, with that outside interest, you know, they get interested in our data and they always ask two questions. Where does that data, where can I find the data and what format does it come in? And the answer to that is sort of like when someone asks you, what's the resolution of your model? You kind of just wave your hands a little bit until they get uninterested. It's not really a good answer. And so this is sort of timely in that proposing this data standard. So I'll be talking about uh, MTH5. I'll talk for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then I'll show some examples uh, after that, which are a bit more informative. Um, 
So if you want to learn more about MTH5, there was this publication just came out just last week. Um, it's here at the bottom. And here are my co-authors. This wasn't done in a vacuum. This was done with a collaborative effort. So, all right, let's get started. All right, so there's a couple motivating factors of why we've made this standard. First is more compliance in that funding agencies, government entities, and research institutions are requiring that data be uh, follow fair principles. And those fair principles are that they're findable. That means that metadata are attached to the data that have proper tags, but that you can find them. So if you have an empty data set, it's got some sort of tag that says, this is empty. So if you search in web browser, uh, your data will pop up. Uh, the data must be accessible. It means publicly available. So it should be archived somewhere in an archive or, or a data center that anyone can access. The data should be interoperable, meaning that it should be human slash computer readable. It can be opened with various software and on any operating system. And finally, it must be reproducible. And that means uh, someone downloads your data, they can look at it and basically go out and take the same measurement. Second driving force is, a, a, like I said, outside interest from, from the community. Um, there's a lot of space physicists. Uh, seismologists are interested in our data, but they're interested in our time series. <clears throat> and there's not really a good format that they can look for. Um, and the third and the biggest driving force, mainly financial, is that IRIS Pascal, the, it's the uh, seismic instrument pool here in the US, they're starting to add MT instruments to their pool. And one of the stipulations of using their instruments is that the data has to be archived at IRIS. And so when they started looking into this, they were probing the community and asking, you know, what are the formats? And they got a bunch of different answers. So they, they decided to uh, form a working group that I'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> so they've, mainly been the driving force behind this through funding. Okay, when talking about data, there's two things you need to keep in mind. So there's the data, the actual values that are recorded. This is usually formatted and structured. Um, it should be structured in a standard way to comply with fair principles. And sometimes there's a difference between archive format and working formats. But what's probably more important is the metadata. And metadata here is from the definition, a set of data that describes and gives information about other data. <clears throat> it's basically, it's telling you what the data mean, how it was made, who made it, where it was made, et cetera. And this part, is important, the metadata part is important, and it, it needs to be standardized so that everyone is describing their data in the same way. So with MT, there's two types of data. We have the time series, which is the raw data that we go out and collect. And traditionally, this has been stored as mostly the format that comes out of the data logger. And Usually it's just stored on somebody's hard drive sitting in their desk. And you know, traditionally, we haven't really shared the time series because there hasn't really been a need to do that. That's mostly because when people process their data, they'll give their transfer functions. And the transfer functions are what we use. And most people don't really want to go back and reprocess the time series. So it hasn't, hasn't been really a, a shareable product. The main product that we use is the transfer functions, and those are a bit more standardized. Common format is EDI, which was developed in the 80s. Uh, and it's, it's worked so far. 
uh, it has some issues. Um, and that's why Hanna Kelbert had developed, has developed the uh, EMTF XML format, which is a bit more comprehensive and more standardized metadata. And it's also more flexible to store various kinds of statistical estimates like, like the covariance. Okay, so those are the two types of data that, that we deal with. There's been some work previously on standardization, like I said, so the EDI, fun fact, you can store time series in there. Um, Allison uh, proposed some metadata standards a couple years ago for the time series. And uh, I just found this out a couple of days ago that Geoscience Australia suggests using MTH5 moving forward. Uh, totally unprovoked for me, so that, that's good. Uh, the transfer functions, so EDI, that's the common format. Uh, Anna's developed this EMTF XML more recently, and these are the type of data that are now archived uh, at IRIS. So any transfer functions that go into IRIS are stored in this XML format. And there's more information if you want to have a look there. Okay, so the standardization process. So like I was talking about IRIS, they were interested in developing a standard. And so Andy Frasetto, he's the project lead at IRIS. He formed this working group that I was lucky enough to chair. And the whole goal of this working group was to develop a standard, a metadata standard and a data structure format that was both beneficial to the MT community and IRIS. So over the course of two years, we argued and debated and developed metadata standards during monthly meetings. And we formulated it so that it's hierarchical and it follows logically how an MT survey is collected. And if you wanna see those standards, they're published here. I won't go through all of them because that's not exciting. But what I will talk about is how they were formulated. So with metadata, so there's a keyword and then there's a value. The keyword is something descriptive like, okay, what's the color of this orange? So color equals orange. And the keyword is color here. So that keyword is described by a couple attributes. So the name, so a full descriptive name, uh, we went with full words uh, combined with underscores. So here's an example, measurement underscore azimuth. That's a descriptive keyword. Another attribute is what kind of type it is. So is this value supposed to be a string? Is it supposed to be a float, an integer, or Boolean? Uh, if it is a string, what kind of format should it be? So say you have a date and time, maybe, maybe it's a URL or an email, or maybe it's only a few words, a few certain words that are accepted. So that would be controlled vocabulary. So say you had something like coordinate system and it only accepts two types, that would be geomagnetic or geographic. That would be controlled vocabulary. Another attribute is, is it required or not? You know, there's some metadata that is definitely needed and some that's just good to have. Um, the next is units. So does this keyword have any specific units? So in this example, we have a, we have a measurement azimuth. So that should be an angle and we'll give it units of degrees. Uh, it should come with a full description. So it should be detailed enough so that someone can understand what that keyword is. If, if it is controlled vocabulary, then it should come with options. So that would be geomatic, magnetic, or geographic. Uh, it should come with an example, an example of how to use that keyword. And then there should be a default value if it's required. So here's our example. So it's got Measurement azimuth should be a float. It's a number. 
it is required in this case. It's got units of degrees, a description, it's got no options, an example, and the default value is zero. So that's how we went through and developed each keyword uh, in our standard. This is how it's structured. So on the far left is the top, which is an experiment. And an experiment describes uh, a tar like a geographic target. So an experiment here could be something like uh, Earthscope or Oslamp, um, Cineprobe, <clears throat> you know, something very you know, focused on a, a geographic region. The next level down is a survey, and a survey is, again, focused on a geographic target, but collected over a, a given time period. So say within OSLAMP, um, so Geosci or Geoscience Australia goes out, collects some data. The, the survey of South Australia goes, collects some data. And each, each, each of those would be different surveys. And then below a survey, you have your stations, and a station is a point measurement. So <clears throat> it's at a single location over a certain time period. Uh, below a station, you have a run. And a run is described as a continuous block of data collected at a single sampling rate. So for long periods, this would be uh, if you go out and you have to fix some E-lines, goats could chew them or change out the batteries or something and restart. Then once you restart, that would be a new run. For broadband, uh, this would be when the sampling rate changes. Each time the sampling rate changes, that would be a new run. And within a, new, within a run, you have a channel. I mean, this is where, you know, this would be your uh, electric channel, magnetic channel, or auxiliary channel. And then within a channel, there's filters. And the way we chose to do this, store this, is that the filters are stored at the survey level, uh, the actual data in the filters. And within the channels, they point, they just have a name that's point to the filters. And that's to remove redundancy, uh, redundant metadata within here. Often we just have, you know, just a couple instruments and we're using the same sensors. And so you have a, survey of 100 stations, you don't want to repeat 25 times what sensor you, you sensor filter. So we'll just store it here and you can only store it here once and then just point to it from the channel. And so each level has its own set of metadata with it um, that describes that certain level. And then each level also has a list of what's below it. So an experiment has a list of surveys, a survey has a list of stations, a station has a list of runs, and a run has a list of channels. So it's a fully comprehensive set of metadata um, that describes your experiment. And so this is just a schematic of what, what, something, what a survey or an experiment might look like. So you have a survey, it's got a, a run, or a station run, run has a couple of channels. This one has a station with a couple of runs and a couple of channels. So it's flexible and um, fully comprehensive. So working with metadata is kind of a pain. And so we developed an open source tool called MT Metadata. Uh, it's, it's a written in Python and it's meant to make working with metadata much more manageable. And within it, so it works with the time series metadata, which kind of what I just described. And then it also works with transfer functions. So it can read and write uh, EDIs, the XMLs, Z files, even reads GF, J files, uh, some average files, um, and we're working on whatever else is out there. Uh, some more information can be found at these links. So how this works. So like, like I was saying, these metadata standards, um, they're important for validation. And 
when I was talking about the keyword attributes, that's how we're going to validate each keyword. So how this is set up is we'll have a standard file which holds all the attributes of the keywords. That's passed to validators so that it, it knows what to validate. So say you have this example, you have a location, it's got a latitude, it's forced to be a float. So the validator will be uh, how to make that number, the input number, a float. <clears throat> um, and then that'll turn it into a Python object. So here in this, ob this example, we have location, latitude. We can have a look at what the keyword attributes are. So again, it's, it's a float number um, and the units are in degrees. So say we have, what, you know, what typically comes in an EDI fi file is a format that hours, minutes, and seconds. So what happens if, if we only have that when it's supposed to be a float? Well, if you input that number, it goes through the validators and says, okay, this should be a float. So how do we turn it into that? And there's some magic behind the scenes that turn converts hours, minutes, seconds into decimal degrees. And so you don't have to worry about that part. Um, so in that regard, this metadata is standardized. So anytime someone looks up a latitude, it's always going to be a float. Um, we have implemented that you can input and output XML and JSON formats it's for easier um, sharing, or if you just want to look at it. <clears throat> uh, so if you're familiar with those formats, this is how it comes. You can also write your metadata in these and then uh, work with that. Uh, we've developed some help tools. So there's pretty good documentation about each metadata standard in, in uh, what we've proposed. Uh, it's here at this read the docs and you can find all the information about any keyword you're looking for. If you're working with the Python console, you can uh, just type help uh, of what you want to find, and it should come up with information that should help you figure out what your metadata means. Okay, so there's two things that we need to sort out. Uh, one is we need to publish what's called an XSD or JSON schema files, and these are just XML and JSON validation type files. So uh, if you don't want to use Python tools, you can validate using uh, JSON tools or XML tools. But the main one that we should do is we should create a permanent working group within IAGA Division 6 that's focused on metadata standards. Uh, most every other geophysical community has some type of working group that works on metadata. Um, and so we should uh, make one as well and come up to speed uh, uh, working with data. So we should talk about that at the workshop if, if we get to go. <clears throat> okay, so that was the metadata and uh, that feeds into MTH5. So the MTH5, the goal is to develop a standardized HDF5 container that stores, meta that stores time series as well as transfer functions that includes metadata in a single format uh, and then provide open source tools to read, write, and access those data from an HDF5. So we went with HDF5 format, which is a hierarchical data format. And it's basically a file system all in one uh, file. And the benefits of HDF5 is that uh, the base code is open source, it's community driven. There's a group that works on it. Um, lots of communities use this, use HDF5, uh, including NASA, NOAA, USGS, a lot of satellite based data is in HDF5. 
The files are flexible. Uh, the file size is only limited by your resources. So you, if you had a terabyte, you could have a full terabyte HDF5 file. Uh, they're portable. They can be used on any operating system uh, from your desktop to a cloud source or cloud-based system. Uh, there's no limitations on how many items can be in your file. So you could have a thousand folders, a million channels. <clears throat> uh, the RAM requirements are optimized so that input and output is only load requested. That means uh, so when you open the file, it doesn't load directly into RAM. It just opens uh, a pointer to where the file is. And then it only gets data when you request it. Um, the compression's inherent. Uh, it's optimized already. You can have some control over it uh, to make your files smaller or, or more efficient. Uh, it does support multiple readers and a single writer. So say you have a file on your system, someone else wants to access it, they can also open that file. Or if you're in some sort of parallel architecture, you could open the file with one processor and a bunch of processors uh, could read from that file. Uh, if you wanna do parallel reading and writing, you need some other tools. Um, which is something we're looking to extend to. Um, and this whole project was funded by IRIS, as well as uh, we got a small grant from USGS Community of Data Integration. Um, so the format of the files, very similar to the metadata. So we have a top level. I should say that within HDF5, there's two types of organization. One is called a group, and that's basically like a folder in your file system. It holds other things. And then there's data sets, which holds actual data. So I'll say, I'll often say group or data set. So at the top, we have an experiment group. And within that group, we have a couple other groups, and that's the standards. So with each file comes the metadata standards in a table format so that you don't have to go back and look at some website uh, that might be out of date. So the standards, up-to-date standards come with it for reference. Uh, you can put reports into this file. So say you, you have a paper or you just have some field notes that you wanna put in, maybe some photos, you can put it in reports. Uh, I'll talk about these two in a sec, but then the next group down is surveys. And within a surveys group, you have a bunch of surveys. Each survey can have stations, so station groups. Uh, also within the surveys, you have your filters, which is important. And you can also have reports specifically for that survey. Um, so at the station level, is just below surveys, then you can have run groups, and then you can have your actual data. So all these channels are actual data sets. And then again, with each group or data set, there's metadata that comes with it. So this format is a fully comprehensive um, data with metadata <clears throat> all in one place. And as shown here, you could have theoretically a full experiment all in one file. <clears throat> um, for the data, we chose to use X-Array, which is uh, it's a it's a format or a an object that allows you for lazy access. So, like HDF five, it only calls data that you request. It uh, inherently comes with a container for metadata. It's uh, indexed by time, which makes it extremely easy to slice or, or search. Um, <clears throat> and it also um, tags the channel name. So if say this is EX, you'll have an X-ray with 
with an EX. So you could just say xarray.ex, get me this. And I'll show examples of that uh, later. And then more importantly, from within this file, there are two summary tables. So there's a channel summary and that summarizes all channels within this in the file. <clears throat> and I'll show examples of that. And it also comes with a transfer function summary. So it gives you all transfer functions that are in this file. I should note, this is sort of an old figure, but transfer functions are stated at the, at stored at the station level. So there should be another box out this way that says transfer functions. And then you can store your transfer functions for that station in there. So uh, if you have various transfer functions, maybe you, you processed at the various sample rates or process with different remotes, you can store that all those transfer functions uh, alongside and in this form. Um, so there's different tools to look at HDF5 files. Um, you can use MATLAB, you can use Fortran, you can use Go, Python, uh, what have you to open files. If you want a GUI interface, there's one uh, supplied by the HDF5 group called HDF5 view. And you can open that file and interrogate it and it gives you everything that's in that file. And you can open it, um, have a look, uh, get information. Um, some workflows uh, that we've built in. So probably one of your questions is, can my data be formatted into this? And the answer is maybe. Um, so we've supported uh, data that comes out of a Zong instrument, a NIMS instrument, a LEMI, and we're working with Phoenix to uh, develop a reader uh, for their format as well. Um, if you have any other data that you'd like to input, uh, feel free to reach out and we can develop a reader for it. And uh, we have some example codes of, of how to do this. This is an example for uh, Zong. Uh, so you just have a list of their output files. You read them in and you can make stations, runs, and then channels using the data. <clears throat> so it's just a few lines of code to read in your data. <clears throat> um, another way to go, or a similar way, is uh, some output formats don't have a bunch of metadata that comes with it. So you'll need to develop that yourself. Uh, maybe using MT metadata, you develop an experiment. <clears throat> so you can input the full experiment into MTH5 and it'll populate all the surveys, stations, runs, and channels. <clears throat> and then when you read in your data, say it's got uh, maybe a station and a start time in it, it'll read into the MTH5 and put it in the proper location. <clears throat> so the whole purpose, well, one purpose of this project was to make a workflow for Iris. And this is an example of how that workflow will work. Um, so if you start over here at the IRIS DMC, so this is the data management center. Uh, it is fully seismic, uh, very, well, for obvious reasons, they don't wanna start changing things to fit with MT. So they're always gonna output uh, what's called the station XML, which is their metadata standard metadata format that uses in seismic. So all the metadata comes in this thing called a station XML, and then all the data comes as mini seeds. <clears throat> um, we've written writers and readers to translate between the two uh, to put into MTH5. <clears throat> um, from the MTH5, <clears throat> you can then put it in your favorite processing program here. We have this thing called Aurora, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is in development. Uh, you output your 
transfer function, and then you can archive that back into Iris. <clears throat> you can also store that back into the MTH5 as well. Um, another way you could go, so say there isn't data yet in the DMC, say you just collected it, you go from your data logger into your reader, into your MTH5, you can send that to the DMC, and then you can also send that to your processing to get your transfer functions. So that's a generic workflow <clears throat> of how we see this working. So there's a few things to do, uh, extend data readers, and that's just kind of some community input. Uh, so if you have various format, just send us an example of, of the format. <clears throat> or if you have a reader already, we can just try to plug that in. Uh, we do have, we got a grant or uh, some money to build a data of time series visualizer. <clears throat> and that will be uh, kind of a browser-based function that uh, will read an MTH5 and you can visualize the time series. Uh, you, can, you should be able to pick some time windows and, and then send that to your processing code. So you process only the good times. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we are trying to extend this to parallel access. Currently that's not extremely important right now, but just nice to have. <clears throat> Uh, something else that needs to be done is a button push to calibrate the data. Um, so traditionally, we usually calibrate the data when we process it. But now that more people are being interested in the time series, we need some way to calibrate the time series data. And I just finished a prototype last night, and we should be implementing it in May. So that if you get an MTH5 file, uh, it could be fully calibrated, which means the data you look at is in physical units. And so you shouldn't have to worry about recalibrating. <clears throat> um, and then the other thing that we need to sort out is how to efficiently transfer over network and uh, we'll probably go with mini seed and in a experiment metadata and then just rebuild it on the other side. But that's more of a computer engineer thing and we're just mere scientists so <clears throat> if anyone has any suggestions please let us know okay so that's the data format and now we've developed open source tools for mth5 mt metadata um, if you've listened in before allison gave a good talk on mt pi and so these are the current repository products that are available. So we have MTH5, talked about MT metadata. Um, so there is this processing code called Aurora that's being developed um, by Iris. It should be out in September. <clears throat> that will use MTH5 files as inputs to, to process uh, transfer functions. And then Allison gave a good talk on MTPy, and MTPy is used to take those transfer functions and analyze them and make your input files for modeling programs. So I'll just briefly mention Aurora. Um, it's going to be based, well, it is based on Gary's EMTF code. Uh, it's funded by Iris. Uh, Carl Kapler is the main developer with help from Lindsay Hege and Doug Oldenburg. Um, it'll be hosted on Simpeg and uh, it'll output a transfer function in the EMTF XML format and using input of MTH5. Um, Allison gave a good talk on MTPy. I'll just mention that it's a bit outdated. And so uh, a version two should come out hopefully by the workshop. And the version two will use MTH5 as a container to store the transfer functions. And so uh, I don't know if you guys have this problem, but reading and writing, say uh, all your EDIs, keeping them in the same location, organizing them, uh, storing the ones that you've rotated or edited uh, is kind of a pain, uh, but you should be able to do that with 
uh, MTH5. You can just store all those EDIs in there and then just pick the ones that you want. Uh, and the workflow is sort of that this, everything goes in this MT collection. Uh, from there, you can make your maps or data files, do some dimensionality analysis, what have you. Uh, hopefully more at the workshop. Um, and so the package synergy of how this workflow could work is that MTH5 is going to be the central container. Uh, it has metadata with it. Uh, you can store your time series. You can also um, store your transfer functions. So if you have an MTH5 file, you can send it to your pro favorite processing code. That'll send back a transfer function. You can store that. You can archive it. Uh, you can send it to MTPy to, you know, plot, uh, make your data files, what have you. So a fully open source workflow. Um, it's a start. <clears throat> so if you want to get involved, um, feel free to start using the packages. Uh, if you find an issue, say you found a bug, uh, feel free to go to GitHub raise a new issue. The benefit is this, of this is that it's a, a public record of what happened. So other users or future users can go back and say, oh, I had that same bug. How did you fix it? You can also raise suggestions, or if you have broad ideas, you can raise new issues. So say you want, hey, I got Metronics format. Can you read that in? <clears throat> or just uh, other issues. Um, so futures, so how do we make this community driven? Uh, basically people just have to start using it. And I realize everyone has their own workflow and why change? Um, that's fair enough, but uh, maybe have your students or younger people start to use it and uh, we can break things uh, and just make it more robust. Uh, we, you know, with the pandemic, Slack has become a good tool for communication. There's a couple channels out there. There's Simpeg, Cooperadium, MTNet has a channel. Um, feel free to raise issues or suggestions there. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and so the whole goal is to make these packages so good that it's hard not to use them, right? <laughs> Easier said than done. <clears throat> okay, so now I'll try to give some live examples. Uh, what could go wrong, right? Okay, so. Uh, okay. So hopefully you can see that now. So <clears throat> all these examples are in Jupyter Notebooks and by the end of the day, they will at least be available in, the, in a repository. And I'll put links in the end of the presentation and give that to Alan. And um, so anybody in the future can download the presentation and then follow those links to these Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so first example we'll show uh, with metadata, with empty metadata. So each each level and each kind of yeah level within the metadata has its own object, uh, and an object just basically holds all the metadata in a nice way. Uh, it has validators that come with it, and it has the standards that come with it as well. So here we're just looking at a location. So here's the syntax for getting that location imported. So I just import empty metadata, time series, import location. Cool, so now we have a location thing that's object that's sitting in, in our interpreter. And now we just need to initialize it. Uh, so we give a variable and initialize this location. And now we can get all the attributes that are in location, 
with this fun, uh, method called get attribute list. And it gives you all the attributes that are in this object, so called location. So say you want a little bit more information from latitude, you can say attribute, uh, attribute information latitude, and it provides you with all the, the attributes that describe the keyword latitude. And like the example before, what happens if we're given hour, minute, second format? Well, it, it's smart enough to convert it into decimal degrees. If this format isn't correct, it'll raise an issue, raise an error. Um, so let's say you have a dictionary where the keywords are separated by dots. So declination.model, declination.value. And you want to set that value. You don't want to, you just want to loop through the keys of this dictionary. You can set the attribute from the name. And it's smart enough to separate the dots into its proper values. So in this case, the declination value is being set to 12 and a half. And now if you look at declination.value, it's set to minus 12 and a half. Um, we do support JSON formats. So JSON formats are this kind of dictionary looking type string. Uh, so if you load in your JSON file, you can say from JSON, uh, your string, and then you can also output it to a JSON. So here we're just inputting it and then outputting it. And this is what the output looks like. It's a nice JSON format. You can also do XML. So this is what XML looks like. Not super easy on the eyes <laughs> I, uh, to look at. Not my favorite format, but it's OK. It's out there. Uh, so we support it. So you can say to XML or from XML. So in this case, we're just creating an XML element. We're changing the latitude value to 10. And then we're outputting it again. And you can see now we have latitude 10. OK, so that's metadata, always a good topic, <clears throat> but uh, something more exciting that you'd probably want to look at is the MTH5 file itself. So here we're going to initialize an MTH5 file. Uh, each file has specific attributes given to it, so at the highest level, It'll give you the file name or the file type of version. So there's two versions out there, but you should use, mostly use version two. Uh, what platform you access this on, what time it was last accessed, uh, the version of software that developed this file, and then the data level one. Something I didn't talk about, um, but I will talk about here. So the data level, there's three data levels. Data level one is just your raw data with appropriate metadata. Level two is calibrated data. And then level three is uh, data that's been filtered or manipulated in a different way. So most of the time you'll deal with level ones or hopefully level twos in the future by the end of May. Uh, there's a couple data set op uh, options and this is how your data is compressed. Uh, if you really want to get into it, there's a lot of information on how you compress files, but uh, the uh, default values are pretty good. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to open an MTH5 file. So you just say open MTH5, give it a file name, and then how you want to initialize it. So you could read it. Uh, if you do use W, you write it. Uh, common is A, which is append, and that'll just open any file that you have read and write capabilities. Um, there's syntax in there, so if you just hit M and hit enter, it'll come up with what's in that file. Uh, and so this gives you the structure of the file. So you got your experiment, some reports. Um, you have your surveys. Um, here we have an example survey. 
Um, you have your filters. These are important. They're at the survey level. So I didn't talk about this too much, but we support five different types of files or uh, filters. So there's a coefficient filter. Uh, we have a frequency amplitude phase lookup table that we support, a finite impulse response, a time delay filter, and a poles and zeros filter. Uh, <clears throat> so then you have your stations, your runs, and your data. And then you have your channel summary, TF summary. Um, so within an MTH5 or object that you initialize, there are all these functions that come with it. So add channel, add run, add station, add transfer function. There's also get and delete. Um, have a look at those if you like. Um, here, we're just gonna add a survey. So you just say add survey, give it a name, add a station. You can give it some metadata that goes with it. And then you can have a look at the metadata station. It has this information. You can add a run and add a channel and then have a look at what you just inputted. So the key thing, uh, two things that are you're probably gonna be most useful is the summary table. So this gives information about all channels in this file. And uh, one thing that comes in this table is called an HDF5 reference. This is a ref internal reference within the HDF5 file <clears throat> that you can load directly. So if you don't know the station or say you want a channel, you don't really know the station name or survey, you can just use this reference and use this method called from reference and it'll load in the channel properly. Okay. So that's basics of MTH5. Here's an example of how you could load in Lemmy files. So you have, say, a directory of Lemmy files. Um, you um, initialize or start with a MTH5 file name. Um, you give the survey some metadata, open the file, open the MTH5 file, uh, initialize the survey, you add a station, and then you loop through all your text files from output from the Lemmy. And it's smart enough to create runs based on those text files, whether the it's continuous or not. And that'll make your MTH5 file. Um, okay, so here's the best example. So say you want to make MTH5 from Iris. Uh, you load in your packages, you initialize a file, and we have developed this tool called make MTH5. Uh, right now it supports just a couple clients. One is Iris. You'll need to make some sort of request table. So here uh, you need to know so this is again in seismic. So you need to know the network, the FDSN code, the station, the location, the channel, these are all FDSN codes and then start time and end time. And so this is what a table might look like. So an entry for a single channel. So again, these are FDSN codes, so they might not make a whole lot of sense, but here's your network code, your station code, your channel code, your start and end time. And you formulate all this into a table and you send this to a request. So you send that table and we have a function called get inventory from your format. This will pull that station XML from Iris and return you what you requested. It's good to always check your inventory before you request data, just to make sure that you're getting what you what you asked for. <clears throat> and so here we just have this function called make MTH5 from the client. And you just give it that request and it will make an MTH5 file. So this takes about just a couple of minutes to make. It takes about two minutes for 
two station, two long period stations. So not terribly long. And so it will make this MTH5 file. Uh, we can open it and now we can have a look at what it created. So we'll have a look at the channel summary. So now it shows each channel that's within this file. And there's something like 60 inputs or 60 channels in this file. Um, but this gives you good information. So say you want to process, you can look at this table or query this table and say, I want all channels starting at this time and ending at this time. Uh, and then you can have a look at your station and remote references and throw those into your processing program. Um, so here, if we have a look at the station, so here's the station metadata that, that was made. Um, so it's a broadband, it's got this name, it's got a geographic name, a location, it's got some provenance that comes with it. Here's the list of runs that it has and the start and end time of that station. So you don't like something in there, you can change the metadata. Um, so you just use syntax that we used in empty metadata. So here we're gonna change declination value to minus 13.5. Um, this will write the metadata to the MTH5 file to make sure that it's, it's in there. And uh, yeah, that's the way you can change your metadata. We wanna have a look at a single channel so we can pull a reference from that table and here's our channel. So it's station CASO 4, run A. It's an electric channel. It's named EX. It's got a start and end time, a sample rate of one, and a number of samples. And so with that, you can look at the channel metadata. It's got a whole bunch of stuff in there. Uh, your electrodes, what their sensors are, their IDs, where they're located, who made them. What, what type they are, uh, all good stuff, and units digital of the channel. So here uh, we can calibrate the time series given all the filters. So with each channel comes this thing called a channel response filter, and that is a list of all filters that need to be applied. So your data logger response, your sensor response, any type of uh, low pass, high pass, band pass filters that need to be applied to get the data into calibrated units. And here we're looking at an electric channel. So it's got a couple filters. These are NIMS data. So it's got a, a coefficient filter to convert to um, physical units. It's got an electric dipole, so convert volts to volts per meter. It has a low pass filter, which is in zero uh, poles and zeros. It's got a high pass filter, which again is in poles and zeros. Uh, and then it's got the calibration filter that's just changing from counts uh, to millivolts. And it has a time delay filter as well. So this is what the channel response filter looks like. Uh, the top is amplitude and the bottom is phase. So most of this is flatlined uh, within the period range of interest and a small phase change. And so we can use this tool called remove instrument response. Uh, again, I made this last night, so it's not quite implemented yet. It should be implemented by the end of the month. Um, but it just shows uh, how we can calibrate the data. So you detrend at zero mean, and this bottom one is your calibrated data and calibrated spectra. So you can now save this as a new channel, or you can create a new MTH5 with a level two, and anyone looking at those data will be looking at calibrated data in physical units. <clears throat> Um, we can have a look at a run, so we can pull a run from that table. Here we are just taking a slice, so you can give it a start time and number of samples that you want, and it'll pull just that data. Um, you can plot the run, so here we have a nice 
run. We've got some two electric channels and three magnetic channels. You can have a look at the run. These are rudimentary plots. Um, hopefully, or we are making a time series viewer, which will be much more interactive. And that should be available, hopefully, by the, the workshop. Um, you can uh, load in transfer functions. So I pulled these from Iris. These are Earthscope data. Um, you can input those into the MTH5 file. They will put them in the right location, so in, in the stations. Uh, it gives you information about whether it has impedance, uh, tipper, and covariance, and it gives you the period range of those transfer functions. And again, location. You can then use MTPy. So this is version two MTPy. It's not mainstream yet. It's actually, um, but hopefully by the workshop. Um, but you can plot those transfer functions using MTPy uh, in your normal way. So you have your parent resistivity, your phase, uh, induction vectors, and phase tensors. You can also plot your station locations within that file uh, on a base map. And again, these are pretty rudimentary, um, but they work. And that is it. That is all I had for uh, examples. Um, so thanks for listening. If you made it this far, uh, feel free to reach out with any questions. Uh, be happy to answer. If you don't have them now, you can send them email or bring them up on GitHub issues or Slack channels. And with that, uh, thanks for listening and take any questions. Oh, thanks very much, Jared. I think this uh, this is initiative that's uh, that's beyond time. We should have had this ten years ago or so. Um, we've got some questions rolling in, which is great. Uh, perhaps I'll I'll use my prerogative as, as host to jump in and ask a couple of questions. <coughs> Excuse me. One is one is with regard to uh, language. Do you do you have a a language metadata specifier? And what I'm thinking here, particularly, it struck me that your spelling of meter. Not everybody will spell meter that way. In fact, most of the world doesn't. So would that create an error if somebody spells meter the, what I would say, the correct way? <laughs> uh, at the moment, yes, that would create an error. Um, yeah, and to your point, I think uh, this brings up the initiative that a working group should be developed so that it's not just a few people uh, kind of in a, a, a blanket right. creating the metadata standards. I think there should be, you know, input from the, um, okay. So when we made the metadata standards, we did ask for input. Uh, there wasn't much input from, from the community, but uh, if there is a working group, I think that's a central point that people can go to and ask questions and bring up these issues. That's exactly what you said, spelling. Like that, that's a really rudimentary thing. Yeah. Yeah, well, units are important. In fact, that's the one big failing of EDI is that nowhere does it specify the units. That, right. You know, so when you get spectra, you don't know whether it's in field units or SI. And so I'm hoping that units is something you really tie down tightly and use, uh, you know, use SI format and SI standards. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was something I didn't quite talk about too much, but yes, we are enforcing SI standards yeah. and units be fully spelled out. Okay. And the SI standard for meter is actually TRE, M E T R E. <laughs> That's a fair call. <laughs> yeah. about, about your uh, another question about precision, internal precision. Do you have a, a precision metadata specifier for? How much precision you want in your flows? Uh, that's a good question. Not, not specifically. No. Yeah. Um, I guess since we're using mostly thirty-two bit and sixty-four bit machines, yeah. it's not too much of a problem anymore. But uh, yeah, that's something, something we should look into. Yeah, you know, thirty-two bits not good enough for uh, a decimal description of a station location. 
because it only gets you it gets you to within 100 meters you, you need to, more than that to get you know if you've got a tight survey with 20 meter 30 meter station separation you need 64 well you need 32 bits um, so you go to uh, sorry um, 48 bits sure okay okay before i've got some more but <laughs> i'll let sure. somebody else speak we got a question from didas mccoy a great uh, good presentation in the workflow diagram you've shown is the reader capable of converting the mth5 data format into the original tser data logger format what is the advantage of mth data format over tser format recorded by the data logger um okay not sure what tser format is no. but uh, i'm guessing that's some sort of formatted binary file yeah, um, Didas, Didas, could you tell us where is that from your data logger, the TSER? Is that is that the um, that's not the Phoenix time series, is it? TSER. Um, okay. okay, well, uh, to answer his generic question, so if you have a data logger, uh, if there is a reader for it, we have not implemented writers. Uh, I don't know if that's important. If it is important to you, then hopefully uh, we can work with it. Um, but the advantage of MTH5 is that now you can house your data in a central location. So uh, whether that be a full survey, you know, a couple stations, um, transfer functions, you can house it all in one place. Uh, and it's standardized and transferable to other people. Yeah, no, I, I think that's the the. Um, I think the the standardization is important. I get. I guess one one reason that uh, Didas might be asking is if you know a lot of a lot of code manufacturers are make um, a lot of instrument manufacturers have their own processing codes mm -hmm. uh, and so this might be a way of taking a, a, another systems instrument and using the processing code that, that people are familiar with sure yeah that might be a good point for readers or, or writers yeah and i guess broadly on aurora i noticed that is using uh at the moment, only Gary Egbert's code. Are you planning to put other codes in? I see Maxim Smirnoff, for example, is on your working group. And Maxim has got a very nice uh, um, code, works very well for long periods. And then there's Alan Chase's code, and there's you know, Jimmy Larson's is my code. Are there plans to expand Aurora to add other options? Yeah, um, so the whole point of Aurora was to provide an open source code for more or less people that use the iris instruments and those people are most likely not going to be mt folks um so it was just to provide a building block uh to make processing code but to your point yeah um so aurora i think it's only funded to support gary's format or gary's uh workflow um there are other open source packages out there so there's uh one called resistix uh there's one called razorback these are both python codes i think razorback is based on alan shaves code and resistix is also based on gary's code yeah. but uh to your point i hope that the community just kind of plugs and plays so if you have your own code you can plug and play, but right. that's my uh, dream. Darcy Cordell says, great talk, Jared. There's a lot of different high level pieces in the larger workflow, e.g. MT metadata, Aurora, MTH5, MTPy. Maybe I'm mistaken, but it seems like the scripts and documentation are currently spread across various different GitHub accounts and websites. Is there one unified place where all these are kept along with documentation that puts all the pieces together? I think that's really, yeah, and that's really important because, yeah, we're seeing a lot of different initiatives that, that are being put, 
pulled together under one umbrella now. And so it'd be great if there was a single place that you went to to get all of these. Sure, yeah, that's a great point. Um, it's kind of like streaming services. <laughs> Everyone has a streaming service, and now we just want to bundle it back into cable, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so that is a good point. And um, yes, we will. You know what? I'll look into that, and I'll start one. <laughs> just uh, time commitments. Uh, exactly. Are there any other questions for, for Jared or discussion points anyone else wants to raise? Uh, no? Well, I guess we'll be hearing a lot more from Jared and from this working group. And again, I'd like to, I'd like to thank Jared for giving the talk and the working group for doing their work. Uh, oh, <coughs> Shunwo Wang has just jumped in. Great work, Jared. <clears throat> this is really needed. When we look at old data, it could cause a big pain <laughs> with poor or no documentation. That's, that's an understatement. <laughs> Yep. How do you think of a standard format for resistivity models or output? That's exactly a point. You know, we've now working towards a format for a time series, but what about models, right? Yeah. Uh, so that wasn't our initiative to begin with, but uh, I think I think Max and uh, Marion have looked into this. Yeah. Um, we've at least at the USGS, we started using NetCDF, but uh, that has limitations with grids, uh, irregular grids. Um, again, I think, you know, Iago Working Group 6 should develop a, exactly. a working group that specializes in how we output models, standard formats. Yeah. Yeah, we did start something a few years ago. Max and Marion looked into it, but we found no desire on the part of the code writers to modify their code they're saying basically we're putting out what we're putting out it's your job to deal with it right so we, we haven't developed a, a standard unfortunately sure which is a pain you know, when you're trying to compare the two different inversion codes you know really compare them mm -hmm. okay and if that's nobody else thanks everybody thanks again Jarrett and uh, this will be up live uh, in a couple of hours and Jarrett will send me the uh, his, his PowerPoint and I'm sure Jarrett will is very willing to accept questions from from the community and hopefully we'll see everybody in uh, in September when you can give us an update <laughs> sure in, in, in <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to get go <laughs> yeah. all right bye everyone bye Jarrett thanks very much Thank you.